After a decade of barbarian terror, the Empire's brilliant General Marius grabs the reins of power, turning Rome's volunteer militia into the greatest fighting force the world has ever known. Now, at the center of the Republic, a deadly revolt is brewing. The bloody death of a gladiator slave is the ultimate spectator sport. By the first century BC, it's no longer a game, and the slaves explode in rebellion against their masters. Their leader, history remembers as Spartacus. Rome's powerful army and philosophy of conquest have enriched the Republican territory, treasure, and slaves. Captured on the battlefield or in conquered towns, the slaves become a commodity. Slaves were people and the Romans knew it, but they pretended that slaves weren't people, that they were tools with limbs and arms and voices. Between the third and the first centuries BC, the Roman Republic expands from central and southern Italy to encompass almost all the Mediterranean. And so the slave markets fill and eager buyers pick over the merchandise. If 30% of the population of the Italian peninsula was enslaved in the first century BC, that would be roughly equivalent with the number of slaves that there were in the American South on a per capita basis, where it's true that probably 35% of the population was enslaved in, say, the 1850s. Slaves could be born into slavery. They could be sold into slavery from foreign countries. Slaves could be captured in war. So there was a great variety of both of the ways that people got to be slaves and also a great variety in the way that people lived as slaves. First century Roman landowner Calumella gives buying advice. My first warning is not to appoint a farm manager from the kind of slaves who please with their bodies. Rather, you must select a man who from childhood has been made hard by field work who has been proven by experience. Not all slaves are destined for field work. The strongest are reserved for sport, to train for the arena as gladiators. These gladiators were very much professionals. They had professional trainers called lanistae who would prod them on just the way a football coach prods on his men, his team, to perform at their very best. They're rented out for people to put into shows, or they're sold to the person who's going to put on the show. They tend to be regarded in this way as being the lowest of the low, people whose bodies are at the disposal of others. Gladiators could be either the top professional fighters in the most expensive entertainment of the time, or they could sometimes be condemned criminals forced to fight. Like championship boxers today, they would train really hard in a very dangerous sport, and then they would only fight a couple of times a year because they were, of course, very expensive. Most of the gladiators' names will be lost to history, but posterity will record the feats of two of these men, one named Crixus and the other Spartacus, a man born to lead. Spartacus was a foreigner, he wasn't a Roman, but he had served in the Roman army. But then something happened. We don't know whether he deserted, that's what some people say, or whether he was thrown out. Uh, some stories are that he then became a very successful bandit uh, on the highways. But eventually, he was captured and forced to become a gladiator by the Roman authorities. Whether against his will, we can't say, but most likely he hated it. Second century biographer, Plutarch. Spartacus not only possessed great spirit and bodily strength, but he was more intelligent and nobler than his fate. Whatever twist of fate brought Spartacus to slavery, it's clear he will not accept it idly. And Crixus will share his destiny.
Few gladiators live to retire. Most die a horrible, violent death, whether in a small regional arena or a great coliseum. Sometimes the crowd is asked to choose the weapons, relishing the violence to come. People were prepared to witness other human beings engaged in mortal combat before their very eyes, and this was tremendously exciting for them. By the late Republic, already people are becoming heroes for becoming gladiators, and they're able to attain some measure of status, at least some measure of popularity with the masses because of their abilities as fighters. By the luck of the draw, the gladiators learn who among them will be the first to die. To add spice to the fight, gladiators usually are unmatched in terms of weapons and fighting styles. Whatever style they fight, their inadequate armor can't protect their lives. They had trained for months, years, so they could use their particular weapons. Having to get so close, they could see the spittle in their opponent's mouth, or they hoped the fear in his eyes. And the smell of blood would have been overwhelming. This was an excitement to the crowd. It was a sign to the gladiators that their very life was at stake. It's like a terrible dance of death for the pleasure of the crowd. Yeah! Yeah! Ah! Hey! But in 73 BC, at the Ludus, or gladiator school, a group of trainees grows tired of taking orders from the Roman guards. They decide that if death awaits them, it will not find them in the arena. Abused and angry, they conspire to put their lives and their training on the line to change their fates. According to second century historian Appian, Spartacus, joined by his fellow gladiator Crixus, masterminds the plan. He persuaded about 70 of the enslaved men to risk a break for freedom, rather than to allow themselves to be put on display for the entertainment of others. Spartacus became a great gladiator, but there was a fire burning inside him. Fire, I guess, resenting the loss of his freedom. Fire desiring justice. And so Spartacus organized his fellow slave gladiators to break out and seek their freedom. The local militia, unused to combat, are wary of the rebels they hunt. They've seen them in the arena. They know the kind of men they're facing. Second century biographer, Plutarch. The gladiators repelled those who were coming out of the city of Capua and seized from them many weapons that were more suitable for warfare. They happily made the exchange, throwing away their gladiatorial armaments, which they viewed as dishonorable and barbaric. As their leader, Spartacus takes his men from slavery to warfare, leaving Roman corpses in their wake. Having defeated the local militia, Spartacus leads his slave army from the city of Capua to Mount Vesuvius, where they seek refuge and make camp at the top of the steep ridge. Spartacus, along with his co-conspirator Crixus, have slipped the grasp of Roman authorities. Now they must prepare their men for the inevitable battles to come. Spartacus had the personal glow and the strength 
uh, that would make people want to follow him, even on this dangerous escape from the gladiator school jail. Mount Vesuvius was an active volcano. It was a dangerous place to hide out, but Spartacus knew that he and his escaped gladiators could find a position on Mount Vesuvius to organize and plan. But a messenger comes to warn Spartacus that the Romans are setting up camp below to seal them in. The Senate has sent in Commander Clodius Glauber to corner the rebels and halt the rebellion. He managed to push Spartacus and his sort of nascent group of rebels up onto the mountain into what seemed like a tight spot. And therefore, Claudius Glaber assumed he wasn't going to have any trouble crushing them on Mount Vesuvius. Plutarch chronicles the plan. Clodius ordered his soldiers to guard the one narrow and difficult access road that led up the mountain. All the other parts of the mountain were formed of steep precipices and could not be traveled. Spartacus and the escaped slaves, only way down is now blocked off. The siege has begun. In 73 BC, Spartacus and his comrade Crixus refused to die in the gladiator ring. Together they lead a slave rebellion, but now the outlaws are trapped on southern Italy's Mount Vesuvius by Clodius, a Roman officer. High on the mountain, Spartacus and his men plot their brilliant escape, as chronicled in the second century by Plutarch. The slaves cut off the useful parts of the vines and wove ladders out of them. They were strong and long enough so that when they were fastened at the top of the cliffs, they reached down as far as the level plain at the foot of the mountains. One of the things that's very interesting about the early phase of Spartacus' revolt is how he seems to know the terrain much better than anybody else does. Now, in part, this can be because herdsmen and other people who know the area around Vesuvius are joining in, they're sympathetic. The slaves who joined Spartacus and his group from the countryside were probably, in the beginning, mostly the herdsmen who were the slaves living independent who already had weapons and were in top physical condition, who became then the soldiers for this gladiator-led army. Spartacus and his ever-growing legion are able to rappel down the cliff, landing just beyond Clodius's camp. Down below, the Romans underestimate the slaves' resolve. You've got to realize that the people who are chasing them look more like the Keystone Cops than Caesar's legions. These are guys who are not part of the regular military establishment. They're being led out by officers who aren't very good officers, who probably have very little knowledge themselves of the countryside because it's the area where they send their slaves. The Romans vastly outnumber the renegades, but the slaves' bold plot is a testament to their ingenuity, desperation, and their hatred of their Roman oppressors and to the ultimate disgrace of the Roman army, these thousands of Roman soldiers and their commander are routed by this small band of gladiators who had attacked them from behind by climbing down the cliff on their ropes woven from vines. With this success, the movement grows according to historian Appian. Many fugitive slaves and even some free men from the surrounding countryside came to this place to join Spartacus. They began to stage bandit raids on nearby settlements. Since Spartacus divided the profits of his raiding into equal shares, he soon attracted a very large number of followers. The one group that Spartacus did not accept into his rebel band were deserters from the Roman army which may seem odd, and yet it makes perfectly good sense. These people were precisely the ones who had chickened out. Second century author, Floris. The daily arrival of new recruits formed themselves into a regular army. They made rough shields out of branches covered with animal hides, and swords and spears by melting down and recasting their shackles from the slave barracks. 
What they cannot make, Spartacus and his men scavenge from the dead bodies. The amazing thing about the Spartacus revolt is that the slaves who are trained as gladiators very quickly retool themselves as soldiers, which doesn't mean they fight in precisely the same way that the Roman army does, but Spartacus himself, some sources say, had been a soldier. Throughout 73 BC, the rebels continue south, gaining in numbers and leaving Roman soldiers in defeat. The Senate calls for another magistrate, Commander Publius Varinius, to stop them. A keen horseman, Varinius brings his best stallion with him, as well as the traditional Roman symbol of power called the fesces, a bundle of wooden rods surrounding an ax. This symbolized the magistrate's power to use force to enforce order. Sticks to beat civilians or soldiers, the ax for capital punishment. The ax was only put into the fast case when the commander is outside of Rome because on military campaign, the commander has martial law power over his troops. But symbols seem to be of little use to Varinius against a slave army. Spartacus troops have already bloodied his own, killing his co-commander. Varinius prepares his remaining men for the battle to come. Spartacus, familiar with Roman strategy, stays one step ahead, according to the historian Sallus. To avoid a surprise attack while they raided the countryside, the rebels propped up fresh corpses at the gates of their camp so that the Romans would be led to believe that guards had been stationed. With the decoys in place, the renegades are free to attack the Romans at will, catching them completely by surprise. Spartacus' force is really fearsome. The officer corps, if you will, are these superbly trained, really tough, experienced gladiators. So they want revenge. This army wants freedom, but they also want to show their Roman masters that they are men, not just tools. Through his ingenuity, Spartacus scores another victory over the arrogant Verinius and takes prisoners from the Roman army. Second century historian Appian records Rome's humiliation. The Romans did not yet consider this a real war, but rather raids and predations of bandits. But these bandits defeated the Romans. Spartacus even captured Varinius's own horse right from under him. This Roman commander was that close to being taken prisoner by a gladiator. The victory is all the sweeter when Spartacus steals the fesces, the ultimate symbol of Roman power. When Spartacus surprises Varinius in battle and manages to capture not only his horse out from under him, but also his fasces, this is a tremendous blow to the credibility of Varinius, but also to the power of the Roman state symbolized in those fasces. Spartacus becomes a figure of fame and fear, and now commands 70,000 rebels. But tension builds between the army's popular slave general and his friend, Crixus. So Spartacus was showing the Romans, I'm as good as a Roman. I, Spartacus, I fought in the Roman army. I have the same understanding of freedom, I have the same understanding of the value of life and death for every man, slave or free. But Crixus becomes consumed with his desire for revenge. He shows the captured Roman soldiers no mercy, writes 5th century historian Orosius. They staged gladiatorial games using prisoners they had taken. Those who had once been the spectacle were now to be the spectators. The slaves grew more violent with their success. Crixus spurs them on, while Spartacus pleads for order. Their unity begins to falter. Then Crixus makes his move, 
unleashing the slaves' fury against defenseless Roman civilians. Historian Salas describes what happens. The fugitive slaves immediately began to rape young girls and married women, killing those who tried to resist. Spartacus himself was powerless to stop them, even though he repeatedly begged them to stop. Until now, the slaves were unified against Rome. Now they begin to turn against each other. It's the moment the Romans have been waiting for. Southern Italy, 72 BC. The slave Spartacus and his army of rebels have managed to defeat and humiliate the Roman troops dispatched to stop them. But now, as his comrade Crixus exerts his own authority, the conflict is coming from within. At the slaves' makeshift camp, Spartacus makes plans to head across the Alps. But Crixus has ideas of his own, writes the historian Salus. Crixus and his people wanted to march directly against the enemy in order to force an armed confrontation. Spartacus, on the other hand, advised a different course. Crixus openly challenges his friend's ability to lead. One of the things that's interesting about Spartacus's revolt is that he really doesn't seem to have had a plan. In the area that he is, he's got now probably tens of thousands of supporters, and he's got to move from area to area around Italy to make sure that everybody can eat. Impatient, Crixus abandons the slave camp, taking a faction of rebel soldiers with him. Spartacus is now yeah. left to lead his people alone. the two men strike different paths across Italy. With the slave army now divided, Rome prepares to strike hard. Consuls Lucius Gellius Publicola and Gnaeus Cornelius Lentulus meet to plan their strategy. The Romans simultaneously thought of the slaves as contemptuous subhumans, but also recognized that these slaves were tremendously successful in battle against themselves. So in many ways, this made it their worst nightmare that these slaves were defeating them over and over again on the battlefield. This untidy rebellion now looks more like an actual war, and it demands a serious battle plan. Every village Spartacus enters could hold a trap or an ambush, or sometimes, according to Sallust, a friend. Many slaves in the towns were by nature sympathetic allies and offered things that their masters had hidden away, or dragged out their masters themselves from their hiding places. These nobles are given as prizes to the army to further humiliate the Republic's aristocracy. From his fellow slaves, Spartacus also gathers food, weapons, and more soldiers for his cause. But Rome's efforts also increase. In the Garganus Mountains of Italy's east coast, Crixus and his faction are hunted down by Roman commander Gellius's troops. The writer Plutarch records it. Gellius made a sudden surprise attack on Crixus' forces, who, because of their arrogance, had separated from Spartacus. The historian Apian. Crixus was in command of 30,000 men. Two thirds perished, including Crixus himself. The Roman army scores its first major victory against the rebels, but the mastermind is still on the loose. The Romans don't linger on the killing field before heading out to crush Spartacus. Orchestrating a pincer movement, Roman commanders Gellius and Lentulus camp on either side of the mountain pass, waiting for their prey. 
but their simple strategy doesn't prepare them for an army of desperate slaves. One of the most important things about Spartacus' revolt was it broke out at a time when the best Roman armies weren't in Italy. They were in Spain or they were off in Turkey. The troops who were sent out against Spartacus had all been recently raised. The historian Apian. Spartacus turned on them one after the other and defeated each Roman army in turn. The Romans were forced to flee from the field of battle in great confusion and uproar. Roman officers faced a really formidable military challenge, and the Roman officer corps not being professionally trained was simply not up to the challenge. Once again, Spartacus has claimed victory over the Roman army. But this time, victory isn't enough. Spartacus demands blood vengeance for the death of Crixus. He sacrifices 300 Roman prisoners. He begins to develop into this massively anti-establishment figure, celebrating his defeat of Roman magistrates, executing Roman prisoners, destroying the property of the rich in the countryside, providing an alternative, really, to the current regime. And that's where he draws his strength. With this victory, Spartacus's army has the chance to escape Italy for freedom. But instead, the men choose to remain in the empire they so despise. It's not entirely clear why Spartacus's forces turned back from the north of Italy. They had enjoyed success to the point that they were sort of drunk with it, and they wanted to go on. And rather than leave, go home, settle back down to whatever life it was that they had enjoyed before their captivity, they wanted to continue to fight. His forces make their way south to the city of Thury, where they set up a base of operations. In the third year of the slave rebellion, Rome finds itself helpless. The Senate calls upon Marcus Licinius Crassus, a wealthy nobleman who loves glory almost as much as he loves money. He wanted to be at the top of Roman society, and that required winning military victories. And so he was eager for the chance to defeat Spartacus, which he thought would be easy, uh, because slaves, after all, couldn't be seriously dangerous. But Crassus, learning from the failure of others, will not underestimate his foe. A strict disciplinarian, he takes his assignment seriously, for his glory and for the good of Rome. Spartacus's growing army of rebellious slaves have become well-organized and apparently unbeatable. Now Marcus Licinius Crassus has devoted himself and his considerable forces to their destruction. But Crassus finds the Roman force undisciplined, cowardly, and ready to retreat in battle. Crassus will not stand for this. After suffering a humiliating defeat against the rebels, he takes drastic action. He will teach his troops the meaning of obedience through the penalty of decimation. Decimation was a terrifying punishment because men were just arbitrarily taken out every 10th man. Maybe you hadn't run away. Maybe the rest of the unit had run away and you had stayed to fight. But if there were no witnesses, you could be pulled out as the 10th man. So you're an absolute terror standing in the line as to whether you're going to be the one who's going to be taken out. And then your death is going to be horrible because your friends are going to have to beat you to death with sticks and clubs. It's not going to be a quick, easy, or honorable death. You're not going to be stabbed or allowed to commit suicide. You're going to be disgraced, and it takes a long time to be beaten to death. Through decimation, Crassus makes his troops fear him more than they fear Spartacus, their enemy. It was meant to shame the men who were doing the beating, as well as the man who's killed, even though he might not have been personally a coward. In the name of discipline, as many as 4,000 men meet their agonizing death this way. 
but the brutality makes its point. Crassus scores a victory in his next battle against the rebel army. Unlike Spartacus's earlier opponents, Crassus was a really experienced soldier. He knew how to train an army, he knew how to deploy an army, he had the necessary experience. And now for the first time, Spartacus is confronted with an actual Roman general, not a politician who's leading out an inexperienced group of men. The forces engage a highly trained and able Roman army against a band of desperate, violent rebels. With Crassus in the fray, the balance has started to tip against Spartacus. Pursued by Crassus's army, the renegade slaves flee to the south, but Spartacus has already planned his next move. Pirates control the waters around Italy. Like Spartacus, they live in defiance of Roman law, or any law. They answer only to gold, and they traffic in slaves. Spartacus sends messengers to negotiate with them. Spartacus tried everything to get his men out of Italy to safety. Finally, in desperation, he made a deal with the devil, with the Cilician pirates. Cilicia is a part of what is today Turkey. And they were famous, these pirates were, for attacking shipping, but they were also famous as the biggest slavers in the Mediterranean. Cilician pirates made lots of money by capturing and selling slaves. So Spartacus had to know that when he made a deal with the Cilician pirates to bring their ships to Italy and evacuate his men, that there was a real danger that the Cilician pirates would simply sell his men back into slavery. He probably had in mind crossing over into Sicily and occupying the island, almost taking it over as a new territory, a new state where these uh, rebels would be able to face Rome on their own terms. The slaves and the pirates strike a deal. The Cilicians agree to transport 2,000 of the slaves to Messina in Sicily. Spartacus hopes to expand his rebellion while eluding Crassus's troops. They haven't a moment to lose as the legions of Crassus close in, prepared to trap and slaughter the slaves like feral beasts. Ahead of the Romans, Spartacus and his horde arrive at the tip of Italy and find no ships. The pirates have betrayed them, and the Romans are closing in. Now Spartacus has to try to fight his way out of Italy against an army that's been restored to discipline by Crassus, that's there in force, uh, and that will finally be able to display the tactics and the discipline that made a Roman army so formidable. Crassus plays it smart. He knows the strength of Spartacus's forces. He also knows time is on his side. He'll starve the rebels out by walling them in, writes Plutarch. This great and difficult work he perfected in a space of time short beyond all expectation, making a ditch from one sea to the other, over the neck of the land and above it, built a wonderful high and strong wall. Crassus is a fully modern Roman general who, among other things, knew how to use field fortifications. And that's what we see him doing with Spartacus. The project, 35 miles long, up to 15 feet high, is immense. Second century biographer Plutarch. When supplies began to run out and Spartacus wished to move off the peninsula, he recognized the impediment formed by the wall. Spartacus is forced inland, 
and yet every attempt to move north is rebuffed by the wall. After three years on the rampage, the rebel forces have been caged. But the Senate, which ordered Crassus to bring a quick end to the rebellion, is tired of waiting for results, according to historian Appian. When the Romans learned of Crassus's siege tactics, they thought it unworthy that this work against the gladiators should be prolonged. A messenger arrives at Crassus's camp, carrying infuriating news from Rome. The Senate has lost faith in him and turned the task over to his greatest rival. The talented General Pompey the Great is returning from Spain a hero, having crushed a bloody uprising there. He is ordered to bring the slave rebellion to its overdue conclusion. Pompey was probably one of the best generals that Rome ever had. And Pompey was, like Crassus, highly ambitious and had more of a military reputation than Crassus. He has an enormous knack for the theatrical. He has a way of projecting his image around the Roman world. He has a sense of PR that, quite frankly, other politicians of his time don't have. Now he's off to vanquish Spartacus and rob Crassus of glory. But not if Crassus can feed him to it. They are two dogs after the same fox. In 71 BC, abandoned by the pirates in Lower Italy, the survivors of the Spartacus slave revolt find themselves walled in by General Crassus's troops. And now comes the great General Pompey, a new threat to Crassus's honor and Spartacus's life. Spartacus is on the move again, having broken the siege that Crassus had so carefully set. Appian chronicles his escape. He staged sudden, small-scale attacks on his besiegers at selected points, hitting them suddenly and sharply. He crucified a Roman prisoner as a visual demonstration to his own men of what would happen to them if they did not win. As the rebels move stealthily through the countryside, Spartacus and his army find their peril has doubled, as word comes that Pompey is also in pursuit. Pompey had already developed something of a reputation for being a cleanup guy. He would show up at the end of a lengthy, grueling, hard slog, so to speak, and walk away with the glory for having brought it to a close. As Pompey draws closer, Crassus becomes more frantic to crush the rebellion before he arrives. Spartacus, hemmed in against the coming onslaught, sends a messenger to Crassus offering a truce. Spartacus remains confident, waiting for word back from Crassus. He's sure the Romans are ready to listen, though the rebels keep their swords sharp. Spartacus tries to negotiate with the Roman leaders because Spartacus sees himself as a free man. That's the way he had started life. And Spartacus ran his army like a Roman army, as if he had the same honor as his opponents, the Romans. But when his messenger returns, it's clear that the Romans don't see Spartacus that way. He is a slave and an enemy. With the negotiations of failure, the day that Spartacus has dreaded is here. Even if he beats Crassus in battle, Pompey will be following right behind. Spartacus can't withdraw. He can't surrender. Second century biographer Plutarch. Spartacus recognized that his hand was being forced and arranged his whole army into battle formation. When his horse was brought to him, Spartacus drew his sword and killed the animal. He proclaimed that should he win the battle, he wasn't going to need a horse. He would have thousands of horses at his disposal. Should he lose the battle, he also wouldn't need a horse. That is to say, he had dismounted, he had joined the foot soldiers in his troop, and he had gotten out there to fight it out to the finish. Crassus and his army meet Spartacus near Brundisium on the heel of Italy. So the battle begins, 
Three years of revolt have led up to this one decisive match between Crassus and Spartacus, the largest confrontation between two strong armies. One source reports that he was wounded in the leg and was so crippled up that he had to get down on his knees, but he refused to quit fighting. According to historian Appian, the killing was on such a scale that it was not possible to count the dead. The body of Spartacus was never found. Spartacus never took the opportunity to get away, which he might well have done individually. So Spartacus was a man who showed that he had a sense of honor, a sense of honor at least as deep and as sincere as that of any Roman who'd never been a slave. Crassus pursues the survivors, killing all he can find, except 6,000 whom he captures and crucifies along the main road to Rome. They were crucified spread out at about 30 to 40 feet each, one by one, for 125 miles. So you can imagine the stench and the disgusting sight that anyone would have had traveling that road. If you were a Roman, this stench would have smelled like dead slaves to you. You were glad to see these people, albeit in their disgusting, decaying form. If you were a slave, this was a message. This was what awaited you if you rebelled against the power of Rome. Crassus vanquishes the slave rebellion, though some of the rebels are lucky enough to dodge the slaughter until Pompey, true to form, has the last laugh. Pompey managed to show up just in time to chase down the 5,000 or so gladiators who managed to escape this combat, this big battle, and he captured or killed the remaining ones. Then, according to Plutarch, Pompey makes sure he receives all the credit. Pompey then wrote to the Senate that although Crassus had defeated the gladiators in battle, Pompey had extinguished the war to its very roots. Pompey's career is very interesting. In fact, Pompey at one point was accused of being a vulture. He was feeding upon other people's roadkill. The Romans rush to put this ugly slave rebellion behind them. When it's over, Pompey receives a triumph, the highest Roman honor for his work fighting enemies in Spain. Crassus receives merely a minor commendation for his efforts against the common slaves who terrorized Italy. Though the end of Spartacus in 71 BC marks the end of the slave rebellions in Rome, slavery continues to bolster the economy of the awakening empire. But the lessons of the revolt aren't lost on the Romans. Spartacus in the Roman imagination becomes almost the equivalent of an Osama bin Laden. He's a frightening figure who's out there. He remains a threat even when you can't see him, and you're afraid that there will always be another one coming up behind him. The Romans realized from this slave revolt that they had to keep their army in tip-top shape. This might have been the time when Romans first began to think, maybe we need a professional standing army to keep us safe at home, as well as to protect us against foreign invaders. But even a mighty empire can't defend itself forever. Long after it withers away, the story of a single man who stands against it still endures. Spartacus survives in legend down to the present. He's been a culture hero for people who are repressed, for people who are downtrodden, right up to the modern age. But while the empire reigns, it belongs to the powerful. <laughs>